Beach? Yes, yeah. Uh, I was the one this morning who went, it's Christmas, it's Christmas. And Carl's like, I said, do you need to sleep? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we reach that certain age when presents become less important and sleep becomes more important. Right. Yeah. Sleep is a present. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> slightly different format than we normally do. We have some awesome music, and then we'll read some scripture, and then some awesome music, and then we'll read some more scripture, and back and forth, and then I have a short message, and then we'll sing some more. Um, it's Jesus' birthday. This is the day we celebrate that. Um, second most significant day in human history to date. And we are going to celebrate it. So if you join me in prayer, Father God, Thank you that this day uh, exists, that there came a day when you came to this earth and walked among us, and that you loved us enough to do that. Lord, help us to uh, really take that into our hearts today and make it ours. Um, that your spirit will in today since we're going to sing and then scripture and so stand when we sing and so we, if you want to if you feel like standing today stand with us and we're going to start off with oh, okay. oh and thank you to Miss Connie for playing now no well. The story of amazing love 
Son of God and Son of Man, there before the world began, born to suffer, born to save, born to raise us from the grave. Christ the everlasting Lord, He shall reign forevermore. The world, the world, come and see what God has done. The And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Exercises. <laughs> oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary, 
and gathered all of While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together, proclaim thy holy Shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Can't wait to see that replay in heaven.
So this thing that happened this night had been predicted. God had told us this would happen. It was part of the plan. Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. And when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles, where most of Jesus' ministry takes place. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And he did, and he's going to. So it's a familiar story, right? 
The pregnant virgin Mary and her husband to be Joseph are forced to make the trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem to register as part of a Roman census. While they're in Bethlehem for the census, Mary goes into labor. There are no hospitals. They can't find a room at any of the inns. So because the city's all swollen from all the other people in town for the census. So the hotels are all booked up. And the only place they can find for shelter so that Mary can give birth is a place where animals are kept. Most likely a cave in, out in a shepherd's field. The cleanest, the cleanest place that they could find to lie this newborn baby was in a slobber-covered animal feeding trough, most likely carved out of stone. Hardly a sanitary place for a fragile new, newborn to come into the world. And normally, the birth of a child, especially a firstborn son, brings relatives out of the woodwork to come celebrate along with the parents. Mary and Joseph, however, are utterly alone, save for the farm animals that they are sharing space with. That is, until God decides to send out a birth announcement. <laughs> it's a grand one. Thank you, that was awesome. God sends angels to tell a group of shepherds working the night shift out in the field surrounding Bethlehem. After the shock wore off, these lowest of members of Jewish society set off to see what the angels had told them about. The shepherds find the scene exactly as the angel described it, and they're blown away. They, have, uh, they leave glorifying God and telling everyone they come across, um, hey, guess what we saw? This was so cool. We saw Likewise, Mary and Joseph are blown, blown away that the shepherds showed up and even more amazed at the story they told them about how they just happened to be there. Mary and Joseph get some much needed sleep and the first Christmas Eve passes into history. And this is the event that we commemorate on this day. But why? Why do we do that? Because the child that was born on Christmas Eve was no ordinary child. While the child was fully human, the tiny form that passed into the world that fateful night, that body was the dwelling place for the mind and will of the immortal creator of heaven and earth and everything that dwells upon it. The child grew into a man, and at 30 years of age, he set out on the mission that he came here specifically to fulfill. His mission was to usher in the kingdom of heaven, to preach the good news that man could finally be reconciled to God. And then he was crucified by wicked men hanging on that cross. Jesus took upon himself the sins of the entire world. Every human being that had ever been born and ever would be born, he took their sins so that all that would believe on him could be saved. What followed his resurrection from the dead three days later was a world-changing movement of Jesus followers who turned the world literally upside down, changed governments, changed dates and history and time. This one man's life changed the entire world, and that's a glorious thing. It's been a definite positive change to a very wicked and broken world spinning off its axis. So in 336 AD, his followers decided rightly that the birth of this man was something that should be never forgotten. Not knowing the exact night his birth took place, December 25th was chosen as the day to commemorate and celebrate it every year. Today, we know it is Christmas Day. It had most likely been celebrated before that, but in 336 AD it became official. What has developed since then is an absolute cacophony of ways in which people around the world commemorate this day. There are trees and presents and ornaments and lights and cookies and candy, family get-togethers, work parties, food, hams and roasts, tamales, green chili, songs, <laughs> movies, TV special, cards, hats, sweaters, matching family pajamas, blow up things in your front yard, and a mythical guy in a red suit. And I'm not disparaging all of those things. 
some of those are really good things. Anytime we get together with family is a good thing. But far too often, I'm afraid most often, those things have little to do with the actual reason why this day is a day at all. Let me put it this way. Far too often those things become what the day is about instead of what the day is really about. What we do is let these inferior pleasures take the place of what is the real pleasure of this day. Of all the days that human beings have experienced on this third rock from the sun, this is hands down the second most significant thus far. This is the day that God physically entered into human history on a rescue mission driven by selfless love. But this is something we tend to do in a lot of areas. We let good things take the place of the best thing. Our focus this morning should be on the birth of Christ and less on all of those other things. Why do we let all these other things, these inferior pleasures, push out the real meaning of this day? And I believe it's because we have lost our sense of awe. A-W-E. We have lost our sense of awe. Awe and God go together like bread and butter. The more we stand in awe of God the better we understand our place in the whole of things and the better we truly realize how blessed we are. There are a hundred things to be in awe of concerning the birth of Christ. Maybe hundreds. Briefly this morning, I would like to draw your attention to two of them. Two. First one is this. Imagine what it took for Jesus to become the babe of Bethlehem. In John 1, chapter, uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, speaking of Jesus as the Word, John the Apostle tells us this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. What was placed into the womb of Mary was God the Son, and he was and remained fully God. Jesus was the very agent of creation. Every single thing that was ever made by God was made through him. Jesus is, without a doubt, the most powerful being in existence period. Think about what that was like to get all of that into a little baby. Let me give you some context for this, because this is imperfect. It's actually an underrepresentation of what the actual was, but I want you to get just a little picture of what this is. The most powerful thing in nature In our natural world, is the sun, right? It's the power and the engine that drives all life on earth. All energy, all everything eventually started with the sun. And it's huge. It's gigantic. We could shove several earths inside of it. It's, it's, It's huge. Now imagine taking that and pressing it down. Pressing it down and pressing it down and down and down and down and down and down. And then wrapping it in something that covers its burning radiance. Imagine the sun being turned into this golf ball. Multiply that times about a gazillion, and that's what it was like to fit God into a human body. The step down from God to man is greater than if one of us were to step down to be an ant. And this compression and covering of the second member of the Trinity is a much closer analogy than, I, than, that, than you think. And I say this because I believe we see it in the Gospel accounts. We see it when Jesus went up with three of his disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is up there and he begins to glow. 
The text describes it. It says it that he had the brilliant white appearance of lightning. That was Jesus' true essence being allowed for just a moment to leak from the inside out. The miracle was not that Jesus began to glow up there. The miracle was that he was able to keep that glow under wraps all the rest of the time that he was on earth. The sun. And then put on flesh. And he didn't just... He didn't come to us as a full-grown man. God didn't just drop a dude into history. Jesus comes to us as a newborn. Jesus came to us as a vulnerable infant. Jesus went from the agent of creation to a form that needed to completely depend on two beings that he created for his existence. Two people God the Father chose specifically to raise him. That family is something worthy of awe and wonderment, is it not? And and if you really let that thought wash over you, really, really let it sink down into your mind and ponder it, I think at some point you're going to get to this question. Why would he do that? You have to get to that question at some point. If you really contemplate what's happened, all that God did, you got to go, why would he do that? If God went through all of that to save us, imagine how badly we needed saving. Imagine how bad, how deep our need was. Jesus did not become a man and walk this earth for 33 years because it would be a good time. It wasn't a good time for him. He he didn't become one of us just to see if he could. He didn't lose a bet. He wasn't showing off. He wasn't tricked into it. Jesus became a man in every sense of the word because he loved us and we desperately needed him to do it. The world was completely lost in sin, false religion, and idolatry, when in the fullness of time, Jesus entered into human history on a rescue mission dropped in behind enemy lines. The best way to restore our awe on Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, and all year long is to make this day really, really personal. This all happened. Jesus did this because you needed him to do it. You were lost in your sins. You were lost in false religion or idolatry. You desperately needed this. Christians too often let fade from their memory how lost they were before Jesus entered into your life. It's like having a fatal disease and and you get cured of it. After a while, the memory of all that disease did to you and put you through begins to fade. What that lapse of memory does in the spiritual life, in the Christian life, is it robs you of your sense of awe. I'm not recommending that you wallow in your past life, but you should never forget what Jesus saved you from. And not one of us today is living sin-free, are we? Jesus' perfect life and shed blood is still covering your sin every single day of your life because we still need it. So, I've been talking to Christians up to this point. If you're not a Christian this morning, I have bad news and good news for you. The bad news is that you too are hopelessly lost in your sin, idolatry, and or false religion. You desperately needed Jesus to come, and he did. And now you desperately need him to come into your life, just like he entered into the world on that very first Christmas night. And here's the good news. He did. He came into this world with you in 
mine. He did all that he did personally for you because he knows who you are, he knows your need, and he loved you enough to do for you what you could not do for yourself. Capture the true spirit of Christmas in your heart by admitting your need, surrendering your life to the care of Jesus Christ. If you do that, you will receive the greatest Christmas gift ever. You will, you will, you will receive a relationship with God. A relationship that begins not in heaven, but right here now. And with that relationship comes benefits, like eternal life. It's worth it. The scriptures tell us that in order to come to salvation, we must come to Jesus like a child. Who gets more excited for Christmas than children? So what better time to recapture or to capture for the first time the awe of what Christmas is really about? God did unfathomable things to make a way for us to be saved. And he did it out of love for you. He knew our need, and he began to meet it on this very first Christmas Eve, which we celebrate this day. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much, Father, for doing this. Let the awe of what this day means, of what happened on this day, this actual event that took place, let the awe of that sink into us again. Let us find it. Let it change our hearts. Let it pull us deeper and closer into you. What a glorious thing you did. Hear our praises, our songs, and uh, know as imperfect as our love is that we love you. And we are grateful for what you've done. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to go out of here praising you out there so that others can know the glorious, beautiful thing that you have done for us that we commemorate this day. And all of this I ask in the blessed and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.
teachings that have ever done that for us. Just one. Oh, no. 